the Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Okay, shall we kick off? Thanks for coming to the session. Uh, last time, uh, last year I talked about colors in language and I was finding myself rapidly sinking into a swamp of physics and linguistics. So this time I have pedaled back very rapidly and I'm going to speak about something which is much more practical and uh, certainly relates to my own recent experience, but I think will relate to that of other people as well. And I very much want this to be a session where we're sort of exchanging exchanging views, uh, mainly the discussion at the end I'll try to finish quite quickly so that that's possible. Um, because I think many people here, I mean it's the nature of the beast isn't it, we don't have a problem getting started with languages or maybe getting to a basic level. Um, the difficulty really is what happens next uh, and um, uh, so how do we improve our languages at a more advanced level? Uh, that's the topic uh, of the talk this afternoon. Um, and I think the challenges are a bit different. We've heard things about motivating yourself initially, getting over, you know, third chapter syndrome and so on when you're learning a language. But um, at the more advanced level, and I'm talking about when you're moving up through the, the top half of the Common European Frame of Reference, uh, Framework of Languages, Linguistic Reference, for example, the progress is less vi visible, isn't it? It's a sort of non-linear progress, not like the initial kicks that you're getting with uh, yet another language, a new shiny bauble that you have. And um, there are sort of diminishing marginal returns. Sometimes people talk about the model of a sort of upturned funnel as well, because the task is getting bigger the further you get on. Or I remember a couple of years ago, Luca gave a talk here where he talked about sort of a reverse bullseye, that you start in the, in the target at the beginning, and then it's moving out in concentric circles. So again, the task seems to be getting bigger and bigger. At the same time, because you've been working on this for a long time now, and you've paid for it with sweat and blood, uh, you're probably more demanding of yourself. You know, I'm trying to learn Basque at the moment, and when I can just communicate with somebody in basic Basque, it feels great. I don't care if it's full of mistakes. All I'm trying to do is get the message across. When I've spent years working at a language, and I'm still making mistakes in it, that really bugs me much more, I think, uh, than it does in the early stages. And also, you may well want to be advancing on, uh, you know, through, through all four of the, the, the skills. So in some ways, it could be a harder task, one that's worth talking about. At the same time, though, uh, there are some good things at this level, too, because you've already got a huge base, you've come a long way in the language, and you can tell yourself you're being hard at yourself at a very, at a very high level. Uh, and and you're, you're really into using the language in real contexts, so the thrill is almost greater than it's sort of, hey, look at me, no hands, uh, before you fall flat in your face. Uh, and, and of course, the deeper in you get, uh, as with anything complex in life, the more thrilling, the more interesting uh, it actually gets. Now, um, many of you have got far further than I will ever do in this process, not least with learning English, because a good half of you, I guess, uh, don't have English as your first language, yet many of you are giving talks in English, have studied in English, operated in English in your, in your work at a very high level. So really, you're the expert. So I'll be hoping there'll be some nodding of recognition at some of the things that I have to say, uh, or we, you know, we can take the discussion further later on. I just wanted to look at um, the uh, Common European Frame of Reference then, uh, Framework of Reference for, for the top levels, the B2, C1, and the C2. So with the B2 level, you're probably familiar, it's discussing main uh, uh, ideas of complex texts, including technical discussions in a certain field of specialization, regular interaction with native speakers without strain, producing a detailed text on a wide range of subjects, and explaining a viewpoint on a topical issue. This sort of B2 level is often the level for if you want to go and study abroad in a, in a university or third sector institution, so you are able to use the language, uh, even if in limited domains, quite, quite a high level. Moving to the C1 and the C2, the advanced levels, uh, C1 is a wide range of uh, demanding longer clauses, implicit meaning, express ideas spontaneously without searching for expressions, using language flexibly and effective for social, academic, professional purposes, producing a detailed text on complex subjects. And this level is, I mean, there's some debate whether this is, you know, the end of your first, first degree, if you do an undergraduate degree in a subject, is it C1, is it C2 level in the language, in, in the British system at least, it might be same where you are or not. There's some debate about that. 
and then the C2 is the top level. Um, you can deal with ease of virtually everything you hear or read. You can summarize information from different spoken and written sources, reconstructing arguments and accounts. You can express yourself spontaneously, very fluently and precisely, the finer shades of meaning, meaning even the most complex situations. And you're approaching what they call the sort of near native level. So these are the three levels really I'm, I'm talking about. Now, um, the time required for these, uh, if you look this up, there are various estimates. This seems to me to be completely meaningless at this level because uh, in case you, unless you've sort of gone through some sort of intensive program, maybe you've done an ab initio, uh, uh, you know, uh, undergraduate program in the language, or um, you're doing an intensive sort of FSI type program or in the army or something like that, the foreign service, where you do have you know, a very clear time frame, very clear number of hours to, cert to, to learn the language. Most of us will have long lost count uh, as to how much time we've actually put into this, probably far too long in some ways. Um, so I'm not sure how helpful those, those estimates are. This is the, uh, in brackets, the estimates for the, the equivalent levels in Russian, which is one of the languages I'm doing at the moment, which is the test of Russian as a foreign language, which is run by the Russian uh, Education Ministry. And um, so, you know, uh, at this level though, so you've lost track probably of how long you've spent on the language. Uh, and what should our attitude be, you know? We hear a lot about sort of the 80-20 principles, hacking a language and so on. And that's all great when you're starting, you're trying to get the initial energy to get into takeoff, to get into orbit. Uh, but at this stage, you know, um, how, how much are these tricks really really going to help, bearing in mind how, how broad the front is that we're trying to advance along. Um, it's certainly not just a matter of, you know, there aren't any shortcuts, uh, but on the other hand, it's not a matter of just the more time you put in the game either, because we want to be as efficient as possible uh, with what we're doing. Um, but it certainly is, whatever tricks we're using, uh, it's going to take a lot of time. But is that necessarily a problem? I don't think it is. Uh, why would you want to rush if you have to? And unless you need a language for your job, uh, for some other practical purpose in your life, if it's something you're doing f as a labour of love almost, uh, which may then have career and other spin-offs, um, you know, why don't you savour the journey? Why, why rush if you don't have to? In some ways, the slower you go, the more thoroughly, the deeper your knowledge will be in the long run, I think. Um, I just want to say one slide just on my back history of what I've been doing and why I came to be thinking about these things. Um, I, uh, my main languages are Russian, German, Welsh at an advanced level. Uh, my Russian I sort of picked up on the wing when I was uh, a postgraduate uh, trying to get ready to, to go to start doing archival research in Russia. And uh, I then did a lot of speaking and reading and listening and I spent about six years in total in Russia in various guises, first as a historian and then later on I, I became a lawyer and I worked in a, a law firm in Moscow. And I was using a lot of Russian with colleagues, although all my written work and the business side was, was done in English. My social life was entirely in Russian. German, the story was similar. I was also sort of self-taught on the wing. I did an intermediate level summer course at the Goethe Institute in Schwäbisch Hall, where I was trapped without a car for weeks on end of a hot summer. And uh, I spent about three and a half years total in Germany. Um, again, not all, not all in one chunk. So I've had loads of reading and, and speaking practice, again, maybe leaving through, living through German. Um, but with both languages, I haven't really done much writing of the language, which I think, I'll, I'll argue, is the, is the hardest skill, uh, it seems to me, the most sophisticated one. Um, and in, in many ways, looking back, I was sort of on what I call a wonky plateau, a skewed plateau, because you get to a level where you've got everything you need, it seems pretty impressive to your friends at home and so on, but um, you're not actually pushing forward because you, you don't need to. So, um, and, but this was all for me quite a while ago, so I've been thinking, well, I want to take this further, I don't want to keep my knowledge rusting up. So, uh, last summer I, I resumed my work on Russian, and I did the uh, Russian exam at the B2 level, the TRKI uh, exam, and I passed that, so I'm going to aim for the, the C1 next, and I'm preparing, preparing that. And I took the Goethe C1 for German uh, here in Berlin last Christmas, and I'm hoping to do the same with the, the uh, C2 one uh, this December uh, back in Berlin. So I'm very much working hard on both of these languages at the moment. I think I've learned from my story after a longish break 
And again, this may apply to you too, but once you get to a certain level, and this is the good news really, uh, particularly if you've taken a thorough approach, you've got a deep, your identity, your experiences are deeply intertwined with the language, you have friends and so on. Once you get to a certain level, the structures, in my experience at least, seem to stay. Uh, if you've done deep learning, you're building up solid experience. Uh, the active vocabulary may temporarily shrink, um, uh, but uh, you know your more passive knowledge remains and can be quickly retrieved. With the lesser used words, my experience at least is a sort of classification of nouns, as I'd call it, sticks in the memory. So you will hear a word you think in, in Welsh, I hear, oh, I know that's a tree, but I can't remember whether it's a beech tree or an ash tree. The same with names of fishes. So more obscure things like this, I find you tend to know quite accurately, but more generally what the word is, but then it comes back if, if you need it or if you start to, to bone up again. At the same time, that's the good news. The other thing I found is um, that it's interesting to look back, you know, and to think, well, which things did I find difficult when I was starting in this language and uh, that are now second nature to me, and which ones are actually still difficult? Because that seemed to me to be quite interesting too. Um, so with German, um, uh, what got much easier is uh, the word order and the sentence structure. When you start German, if you're an English native speaker, particularly the uh, subordinate clauses, the way that the verbs move around, uh, seems very, very, very much a challenge. But later on, this remarkably quickly uh, seems to become a sort of automatic uh, process, in my experience. What doesn't seem to have got any easier is the genders of the nouns, and I know that you're supposed to learn the, you know, after 20 years it doesn't work, you know. You remember the, the noun, you can't remember the gender. And of course there are rules and endings which are grouped and there are exceptions and so on, and you can use monomics and so on. But nothing really seems to me to stick. And that is a, that is a big problem, and all I can think of is it's just more and more practice. Uh, mixing up vowels, I'll come back to this, but uh, that's something I do quite a lot as well. Or you're vaguely right with the word. So I say something like, das Geschmack when I mean der Geschmack. Yeah, I find that sort of thing seems to happen a lot. And, and maybe it's just me, I don't know. With Russian, the K system is uh, a bit of a nightmare when you start going, but I found that pretty rapidly once you get it well into the intermediate level, uh, that becomes, again, second nature. It's very functional, it's expressing something which you need all the time, and it ceases to be the big headache that it was. Uh, other things for me have stayed headaches. Um, uh, the conjugation of the verbs, the verbs, again, it's simple enough on paper, but uh, particularly, you know, ir irregular verbs and, and um, uh, stem changes and so on, uh, there are very, very many different patterns, uh, which is a matter, again, of, of constant practice, I think, I still find difficult. Verbs of motion, again, uh, complex if you know Slavonic languages, uh, easy enough in theory, but again, to do it all pra in practice correctly, I'm still working hard on that. Mobile stress is another thing in Russian, that the stress can move around according to the, whether it's a genitive singular or plural, whether it's singular or plural, in the accusative and so on. And this, again, is, I suppose, it's akin to the problem you have in trying to learn, you know, uh, to, to the pronunciation of English words written down. It's an area of the language which is just objectively a, a bit difficult if you're not a native. And I think the pronunciation challenges as well have remained the same for, that have remained for me. Uh, in the languages, so I'll come back to that a bit. But So what should you be doing at this level? If you've got to um, an intermediate level now with your language, you're somewhere in the middle of the bees, um, what, do you, what should we be doing to get better? You want to take it forward, what have you done? Um, well, you know, something which we're all familiar with is the idea you've got, to, you've got to develop all the four skills together at this stage because they all reinforce each other. Uh, so I'm going to look at all four, reading, writing, uh, speaking and listening. Um, I think you need some focused practice. This came out again as a bit of Jan's talk I just attended. Um, uh, you know, you need to be looking again at some of the structure and some of the grammar. This idea of taking your game apart. Listen, when tennis players do this, you may be a, you know, a top ten player. Doesn't mean you don't take your service apart again. Your coach works with you, and uh, you go right back to basics. Because if you've been speaking a language quite well for a long time, what you're finding is that you've forgotten the rules. Really, you're doing what seems to work. And um, there may be calcified mis mistakes frozen in there, or things you don't properly understand which are holding you back. So really taking the thing apart without becoming, you know, just repeating the same activities is, is a great thing. First of all, it's important to arm yourself with the right materials.
So textbooks, at this level, if you can find them, I think you're not too big for a textbook. You may well think, oh, I'm already now into the seas, um, and you know, look at me, I shouldn't need a textbook even, it's a sort of dirty little secret, I've got it under the, under the cupboard, I'm not going to admit to it. Well, here I am fessing up, here's a photo of some of my textbooks. Um, why do you need them? Why are they good? Well, first of all, they give you, particularly if you're going for an exam, or you're going to need the language in a certain context where it's advanced usage, they're giving you an objective system. There's forced variety. If the book's well designed, then the authors are going to take you through different areas of life, yeah? And you're going to be forced to look at different materials in different registers. There's some objectivity there, again, a similar sort of thing. You're not just going after your favourite topics, which, of course, is important to do, and that's what we say at the beginning. You should be following your own, your own interests in the language. That's what's going to give it meaning for you, and I'll repeat that again at the end. But at the same time, if you're wanting really to get better to get out of your comfort zone, that includes moving into um, different, different uh, areas of, of discussion and, and practice of the language. And they're also going to give you, you know, graded practice and this idea of taking apart again some of the basics, the grammar structure, the vocab, and the more advanced uh, or abstruse areas of grammar which you, you may not, um, you know, you may be a bit shaky on. The titles, of course, are thinner on the ground at this level. We heard earlier on someone saying that, you know, uh, there may, you know, maybe only 200 languages of written material. Yeah, hi. And most of them, um, you know, most of them seem to peter out in the middle because of the market. It's market economics. There's much less material around at this high level. It's the pyramid of learners. And um, uh, so, you know, they are thinner on the ground. But if you're going for big language, then there are materials to be found. It's been harder for me to find things for Russian uh, than it has for German. Um, it's not easy for German, but there is stuff. There is stuff for Russian too. It just takes, you know, you have to look around a bit more. The internet's a wonderful thing. Um, be careful with the title. Sometimes advanced is used in a title just because it's the follow-on book for the second year. Uh, so don't, you know, if you're ordering something from Amazon or something, make sure that you've really looked at the blurb and uh, it is actually at the level that, that you want it. So um, this one actually, Russian by Kagan, from Intermediate to Advanced, is I think a slightly lower level, actually. Uh, it's one of the books in English, the Routledge one. Um, it, it, it sort of, it stays at the intermediate level, really. But it's still, it's still useful. So exams, that, uh, sorry about the photo, that's me. <laughs> Um, uh, the old selfie, um, uh, going into the Goethe Institute last December. Um, I think exams are quite useful. Um, get a pre-exam assessment of your level if you can. Again, it's some perhaps unwelcome objectivity. Uh, it may not always be accurate. It's also not the last word because you go in for an assessment, it's half an hour. You may be a bit rusty, you may underperform. The assessor might have had a, a bad day and so on. But even so, it's quite useful to go and have a chat with someone, maybe to do some multi-choice questions, which I did at the Goethe Institute in London before I started working on the, on the C1. Um, again, there are motivational targets. If that works for you, why not? If you can afford it, uh, go for it. You've got to pay, but you know, if it makes sense to you in motivational terms, do it. Um, they give you, again, this objective yardstick. There's nowhere to hide uh, when the result comes, like it or not. And it may be useful to you in the market. If it's a career move for you, uh, you know, then it, sometimes employers like to see that objective uh, certification down on your own CV as well. Then there are the minuses, which of course are well known. Um, you know, you, it's an artificial exercise in a way. You want to be careful you're not working to the exam, as it were. So one thing I tend to do is I've got a three-month project. It's only really in the last month that I really crank up doing the, last, the past papers and so on. Because for me, that's, that's a period of time when I'm enjoying the language again. And I don't want to spoil it entirely by the fact that I'm just learning towards and coaching myself towards an exam. So I'm doing some things I really enjoy doing the language as well, and things which are not so focused on exam technique in the first two months, but by the third month, I really am then cranking out the past papers, timing myself and so on, because it is, that's the name of the game. If you want to play that game, then you should, you should do so. And, you know, do you actually need all four skills? Again, in the, in the language exams, the German ones are split into four sections, the four skills, 25% each. 
So it's no good being brilliant at writing, but you can't, you know, you can't open your mouth and vice versa. You've got to pass all four sections too. The Russian ones have five sections, those four, plus a multi-choice of grammar and vocabulary. Um, and uh, so again, you need to develop across, across all four, but do you need that, you know? Well, I was saying earlier, you know, at this level you probably do anyway. So think about doing the exams. Uh, grammar books. I think a standard reference work is great. Um, ideally, I like them with self-test questions because you can, you know, you just get lost in a massive text. It's difficult. It doesn't mean you, it's not much use to read it cover to cover. But you do need a reference work at this level. You're dealing in the finer points of the language. So if you can find one in your language which has pretty comprehensive coverage and also has a workbook which goes with it, with answers in the back, it's a great way to be progressing uh, between you know, your lessons with the teacher. If you're going to work with the teacher, we'll talk about that in a minute. You don't want them to be doing things for you that you can do uh, yourself. And the self-correction self book is a great idea for that. And of course, reference works in your tar target language as well at this stage are going to be potentially useful. Just be careful you're not overwhelmed. Um, uh, and, you know, because there will be so much more detail in some of those, again, depending on which one you choose. Vocabulary. Um, advanced collections of vocabulary. Some people like working with these. The Cambridge Uni University Press does a series for English, English people, speakers, you know, using Russian vocabulary, using German and French and so on. Routledge does the frequency dictionaries where you have example sentences often as well. It's quite useful for remembering in context. Do people like those? Um, I find them actually a bit, you know, I buy them, but I don't actually do much with them, to be honest. Uh, they're just there sort of sitting accusatory, accusatorially on the shelf, uh, looking around, because there's, there's just too much as it is. Some people like the root and branches sort of analytical approach to Russian, where you're pulling, pulling a, a, a apart the... Uh, the way the words are put together and so on. Native dictionaries uh, also, of course, very useful for context and explanation. And I'm finding that my pretty chunky uh, English to the other language dictionaries are, and vice versa, often breaking down this level and that I'm having to go to. There's just not enough detail always to the native dictionaries. Um, and particularly if you're doing poetry or something like that. Um, whether you're going to note new words, whether you're going to use spaced recall, uh, David's goal listing method, uh, whatever you're doing to activate your knowledge, um, you know, work, you're working on, working on your own system. But the th a, thing to, a thing to note, and I think what I'm doing is just lots and lots of exposure and lots and lots of writing practice and lots and lots of speaking rather than actually systematically uh, trying to expand the vocabulary. I don't actually personally feel that that's, that's my main problem as it happens, vocabulary at this stage. But, uh, um, uh, it's the other things that I mentioned. And a fine distinctions in meaning become important as well at this level, of course, and things which you could probably gloss over uh, later on. You probably all had some, uh, some moments like this when you're working at your advanced language, those what I call those not so advanced moments when you suddenly come, across against, uh, come up against a word which is relatively common in your la own language and you wonder, how have I got this far without that word? So I remember before Christmas, I was talking to my German teacher, we were talking about Christmas, decorating the Christmas tree and so on and so forth, and the word holly came up, it was a Stechparma in German. I had never heard this, it seems to be used much less in Germany at Christmas. In Britain, we use it to decorate everywhere at Christmas. So, you know, it's a word like that, which is relatively common, at least to me, you're relatively common. I'm not saying it's the top 2,000 words and so on. Uh, but, you know, you do think, oh, but I, didn't, I should know that, and I didn't know it. Uh, similarly to the hard shoulder, it's the, you know, the stripe at the end of the side of the, the lane at the side of the motorway where you pull off if you've had a crash. Uh, it's another one I came up against, the river noughts and crosses came up, which is a little game you children play in my German lesson a couple of weeks ago. I've forgotten it already in German, but I thought I should have known that as well, I still don't. Another thing is those not so advanced moments is the sort of the, uh, the advanced confidence, the clever mistakes which you start to make uh, because you're starting to think that you're quite good. Um, so you start going off on a creative frolic, maybe with compound items which you haven't actually heard yourself, but you think should work. So, so you, because you think you can, so you know that a, uh, that a, 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 a bus driver is busfahrer, so a train driver is obviously zugfahrer. Yeah, it's obvious. Well, unfortunately not, it's Zugführer, yeah, so a Lokführer or whatever. So, uh, again, there is this problem at this stage, and we're going back almost, even more at this level, to that advice, use what you hear the natives using, yeah, uh, because that's the way to be sure that, be sure that you're right at the end of the day, we, I, I think. Um, learn a specialist vocab as well to talk about the language. 
So, um, you know, so that you are able to um, converse with your teacher about the language in, in the language itself. It spoils the flow, I think, if people keep referring to, uh, you know, active participles or whatever it is, or the word punctuation or whatever, whatever in your own language. So make sure you learn the list of those as well. At this level, it goes back to what I was saying about doing what the natives to do. I think the, the sort of chunking idea and collocations become even more important for fluency and to sound natural. We all know that, you know, when you're learning a language, it's not individual words, it's really chunks which you're able to employ rapidly uh, as you speak. Uh, but as you get to this level and it bans on your abilities to express yourself and the rapidity and fluency with which you're expected to do that have increased so much, the only way you can do that is by, you know, clicking all these set, set phrases into place very rapidly. Uh, it's not just about getting your message across in a rough and ready, wa uh, rough and ready r way anymore, as I try to do with uh, my Basque, for example. So you're going to learn set phrases all the more. And, uh, um, you know, I do think that's a great thing. I tend to write them down and listen to the radio. You know, you hear them a lot in news broadcasts and so on, the same in, in newspapers. Uh, and, and then once you've heard them once, you tend to hear them again and again. And hopefully before you know where you are, they're, they're tripping off your tongue. I just want to say a bit about using teachers um, as well at this level. Um, whoops. Yeah. Um, excuse me. I think this is where the native speaker teacher does kick in. I'm quite a fan of using non-native speakers when you're beginning to learn a language because they understand the problems you're going through, particularly if it's somebody of your own, you know, the same L1 as you. Uh, those people understand very well and can sympathise with you at the early stage, and I think that makes a lot of sense. At this level, however, I do think that, you know, you want to be, uh, you know, a native speaker has their finger on the pulse of the language, and it's a good place to start. I'm not saying... You know, never use non-native speakers, but I've certainly, I'm only working with Russian native speakers or German native speakers. I always use Russian native speaker for my German and a German native speaker for my Russian. No, 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 just checking you're still awake. Um, but, you know, once you've got them in place, and I use iTalkI online, it's great, you know, you can book, book in advance, so you're, you know, you're trapped in, you can't get out of it, it's at seven o'clock tomorrow morning, whether you like it or not. It's too late to cancel after 24 hours before, you'll lose your money. Uh, spoil the relationship with the teacher and so on. So box yourself in, it's only human nature to try and wriggle out. Uh, take responsibility, yeah? Um, particularly if you're doing an exam, your teacher probably doesn't have many people at your level. And that's nice for them in some ways, perhaps, at least I hope it is. Um, but it doesn't, don't accept that, expect that they're going to be up to speed with what you need uh, in terms of the format and the syllabus of your exam if you're doing one or whatever your needs actually are. You've got to express them, you know, um, so if you're going to be doing a television interview in the language or something, or you're going to be working in the, uh, the oil industry or something, in a, uh, you know, you want, you want to make sure they, you are directing them uh, as much as you can because what you're looking for might not be obvious at this stage because you are, you know, at, at a unique level, really, in, in some ways. And there's much to do, so, as I said earlier, don't use the teacher for things that you can do yourself, such as, uh, you know, checking up the points, uh, points of grammar, grammar exercises and so on. They should be pulling you up on repeated mistakes that you're still making, perhaps, if you're having difficulty with points, or you want to reinforce with the teacher things that you've been studying on, on your own and you've, you've realised are, are your weaknesses. But at this level, you should have a real sense of uh, what your strengths and weaknesses are. They will correct that to a certain extent, but to some extent you'll be right. You can work on those things yourself and then have them reinforce them and sort of act as a control. For me, uh, it's mainly been speaking practice because I'm living, obviously I live in London at the moment, so I, I'm not in, a, in Germany or in Russia. So I need someone to speak with. There are other ways to do that, of course, always, sort of virtual immersion, lots of stuff going on, particularly if you're in an international city. But I'm busy, I'm working full time on other things. So uh, I don't have time to go to meetups, you know, in, in the German pub and so on, which there is not far from my house, actually, but just too far to be convenient. Uh, and, um, you know, so I'm using them for conversation practice and also for writing corrections. So I'm doing written work, I'm sending it to them, we're correcting it then together using uh, you know, doc, Google Docs online in real time. 
Uh, you can't expect your teacher to correct your written work in advance of the lesson unless you're going to pay them for that. But you can actually do it together, which again is quite useful because it's reinforcing, it's repeating, uh, it's bringing, dragging the thing up through your mind, kicking and screaming yet again, and then having made the mistake, it's hopefully helping the point to stick or it's telling you you need to go back to that, ch that you know, subsection of your chunky grammar book. Uh, that grammar book which is, you know, going to be with you for the rest of your life in, in, and, uh, you know, uh, in your language journey in this language. Um, what about listening and reading with a teacher then, the more passive skills? Um, well, um, there's something I wanted to look at too. Um, but first of all, yeah, sorry, just a bit about speaking. Uh, I mentioned, you know, if you are not like me and you're actually living in the country, don't get complacent. Uh, you don't want to be get, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you're doing the same thing every day, you're going to the shop, you're buying the bread, you're talking to the bus driver and so on, you're feeling very fluent, but you know, as people say, there can be fluency at different levels, are you just actually becoming increasingly fluent uh, in your comfort zone at the A2 level or the B1 level? Um, so don't lull yourself into a false sense of security uh, if you are living in the country. If you're not, and so really you're putting a lot of uh, emphasis on the teacher as a conversation partner, then um, I think the danger, and I sometimes fall into this, particularly as I've got to know my teachers a bit better, I've been working with some of them for over a year now, is you spend the lesson, you know, half the lesson just chatting about what's been going on for this, this week, which is very nice, it's all useful practice, but again, it will be you in your comfort zone probably, and so keep, keep a lid on that to an extent. You've got to be careful um, that you're actually being forced to engage beyond uh, what you're familiar talking about, and that's why working through that textbook as subjects to discuss can be quite useful, pulling down articles from the internet, uh, however you're going to do it. Um, uh, register, be aware of the different uh, registers in the language, of course. Uh, and practice what you're going to need. Uh, for the exams, it, the standard language is, you know, erring slightly towards the formal is more important. Um, slang is not required, generally, uh, but you may, you know, your needs may be very different to that. So, but uh, awareness of register at this level, of course, is uh, really all part and parcel of, of the game. What about pronunciation? I found, as I said, that uh, it's the same old problems for me with German as an English native. It's some of the vowel sounds, the umlauted sounds, mixing up I, E and EI in present and past and verbs and, and that sort of thing. Russian, again, it's, it's remained the same old problems, uh, the distinguishing between the soft and hard consonants. Uh, the two I, I sounds you have in Russia, Russian. How do you get better at all this? Do you rely on your ear? Do you get into studying phonology? Should you take coaching? Do you repeat with audio books? You know, I've tended to rely on, you know, just more and more practice with the teacher. Some people argue you should do, you know, uh, you should focus on uh, the contrasts within the, with the particular difficulties that you're finding. So I'd be interested for, for ideas of that in the discussion, on that in the discussion afterwards. That said, you know, it's a wider picture, isn't it? It's, it's, it's throwing yourself spiritually into the language, listening a lot, practicing, and, um, you know, at this level, hopefully your accent is already, you know, it may not have gone away entirely, and you don't necessarily want that anyway. Nobody wants to work as a spy, necessarily, in the language. <laughs> uh, but you don't want it to be an impediment an impediment either, and indeed, if you're going to do an exam, then it has to be a certain, you know, to a certain level. Otherwise, it's going to be a factor in on passing. Writing, uh, writing. I think that it's it's the most difficult skill. As I say, it's the one I felt light on because I'd never had to do it much. And if you think about it, you know, in your own language, you can speak it pretty well, you know, perfectly when you arrive at school, even if you can't discuss philosophy. Um, but writing takes you another 10 years to learn, and, and uh, some people never get very good at writing in their own language. So it, it is an artificial and difficult exercise. It's less flexible than speech. Mistakes can't be filled over with fillers, gestures, body language in the same way. There are also an additional set of rules on punctuation and layout. Um, and so on, I found particularly, again, I, I'd read them in, in theory, I knew the, diff the different rules, but actually in practice I found I was often using uh, commas, overusing commas in the wrong places in German on an English model. And you start, if you're doing writing with your teacher, they'll keep saying to you, that's a typical English mistake, that you could pretty soon see the pattern and you're able to do something about it. Um, and then, of course, uh, you may be more, you know, you're not doing an exam or you're, more, you're into a lot of texting, you've got a whole other, lot of areas and things you might have learned actually much earlier in your language journey. 
the sort of abbreviations which people use in the language. So um, uh, in Welsh, for example, for, for me, it's V, uh, which is spelled F-I, but people use the V uh, uh, as in the, the letter V, which actually doesn't, uh, isn't used in Welsh because the, the pronunciation of that V, it sounds the same. So there's that sort of thing. Wythnos is a week, so people go eight and then N-O-S. So there's a whole text language. So whatever you're into, you know, uh, learn to type as well. It's one thing I'm doing late in the day in Russian. Uh, and it's really transforming my presence on Facebook and so on with my Russian friends. It stopped looking like some sort of emaciated Polish uh, as I tried to, uh, you know. Uh, and and I'm, I'm a, a very fast touch typer in English, so um, I'm trying to learn that technique in Russian too. And, uh, no, I don't know. Hello. That's Hello, not classic. normal. Okay. That's One second. Take it again. Uh, I like it. Uh, Hello? Yes, okay, that one uh, is, so, did I, okay, right, right, I don't know what I did, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, it said low battery, it did say that, so, um, yeah, so th there may be things like that you've been putting off depending on your language, um, and um, uh, so that's something, uh, something which, which you might want to do. Um, for me, it's saying it was, it was a neglected skill, and so my, my approach there is just practice, practice, practice getting constant constant feedback. What I've also been doing is a lot of translations from English into the target language. Now opinion, as you'll know, is divided on this uh, because it's seen as a sort of as a very traditional approach. It's a bit restrictive, it's a bit uncreated, but uh, uncreative. But I found a lack of flexibility and I found some old sort of called prose composition books for German and Russian for uh, uh, advanced students from the 1960s and 70s, very old books. And I've been using these, they're short chunks, and I think they really do force you to come up against the finer points of meaning. Because normally when we're expressing ourselves, and we'd encourage you know, people to do this, you say round what you actually mean to get the meaning there, which is great. You see a four-legged animal run across the, the courtyard, it's actually a cat, you know, as I used to say to my Russian friends at the beginning, I'm gonna call it a dog, I know it's not a dog, I, can't, I don't know the word for cat, that sort of thing. Here you really do have to say cat, so you have to find out how to say cat, hopefully it's not that, level. Unless, unless it's one of those words that you've got this far thinking, well, how did I never know that word? Um, but you know, I was, so I came up with the word rocks at the bottom of a cliff, and there are these two different words in German, felsen and klippen, and what's the difference between the two, when are they used, uh, you know, you Google image, you get the same sort of pictures and so on. That's just one example. But uh, it's these finer points that you would n navigate around when you're speaking even. But if you're forced to do this exercise at the higher levels, you can get a lot out of it, which will ricochet through your language, enriching it and strengthening it in all areas. You could do other things. A uh, free prose composition, of course, is a more realistic, you know, you write, you've got to write a CV or an, a letter very often in the Russian exam, something like that. Um, but again, you can then bypass the difficulties and say more or less what you wanted to say. You don't have to render exactly or as closely as possible. Uh, so it's a different sort of exercise if, uh, uh, if a more realistic one and perhaps more useful in, in practical applied terms. Keeping a journal you could do, blogging, social media, all sorts of scope for actually getting your writing up at this level. Um, and again, as I said, translation and free composition, if you're working with a teacher, they're going to really highlight both the, the frozen difficulties you have with the language, you know, are you really confident on those German adjectival endings, and, um, yeah, and you can't mumble your way over them when they're in print, and, uh, uh, you know, also typical interference from your native language in terms of structures. Uh, and punctuation rules. Reading, make full use of your textbook materials. Um, uh, uh, some people like bilingual texts still, I've never really liked them. Some people like graded readers. What I tend to go do is to go through and underline words as I read. I'm reading novels, a newspaper article or something with the intention of going back and checking, checking them or with the dictionary later. And I've got a stack of newspapers from you know, 15 years ago and I, and I still haven't gone through and checked. Uh, checked the words and looked them up. Uh, so, but I do do it. Maybe the act of underlining sort of helps. But if the word is re repeating, coming up several times, then you might want to go and look it up. But as somebody said in one of the talks earlier today, uh, you know, you don't want to be checking every word. You've got to become happy with, uh, confident with uncertainty, with guessing, 
um, a, a lot of the stuff and you'll find it will, will start to make sense. And people often say, you know, you should at least, I remember uh, uh, Professor Argelius gave a talk in, in Novi Sad where he was saying, you know, if it's more than, you, you know, 5% uh, of the vocabulary you're not understanding, maybe the text, maybe you should move to an easier, easier text. But if it is only that, don't keep stopping, uh, you know, put the emphasis on the enjoyment and the progress and, and the most important words will probably click click anyway. In the exams I found with reading, the main challenge is simply the time pressure. Uh, and sometimes the exercises can be not quite clear what, what they want, so you've got to work on your technique. But also the sheer, the sheer uh, time pressure uh, is part of the exercise at this level, which is why as an exam does approach, uh, you know, a real life situation, you have to practice that uh, in advance. Uh, listening, there's an embarrassment of riches these days. Um, you know, uh, do you prefer factual or creative? There are so many things, podcasts, radio broadcasts. Try and make it interactive. Uh, that's my trusty internet radio there, which goes on in, in everywhere in the house, gets carried around. Uh, you know, it, it, again, when I get time, I try and listen with a clipboard, trying to write things down so that it's not just purely passive. Try and look at it, looking at, looking at it the next day. Um, and maybe retelling what you've heard. You've heard a report, you can then retell to your teacher. Obviously, you don't, you don't want to sit with the clock ticking, just listening to something with your teacher sitting there next to you or on the, on the screen. But you can listen to something and then retell, I was listening, you know, preparing it in, in advance so you've actually pulled it apart and it's become more of a, of a, of a, of a, a creative interaction. Um, with with uh, exam listening, uh, I think it's you know you're summarising information often in a, in a telegraphic style. The time for getting your answers down can be a challenge. Uh, the speed of the recordings, uh, you know, and you may only hear things once as well, once or twice with the, the hearing tests in exams. The final slide. Then you know what about uh, going further, getting beyond the seas? It's near native level. How are you going to take it further? And this is all still relevant at the C level, C1, C2. Uh, obviously you want to be moving in if you're interested in creative literature. Poetry is the hardest thing, I think, because it's really pushing the boundaries of the language. It's the, it, you know, the most flexible in terms of uh, uh, you know, cultural references, the broadest word order, are, you know, uh, less common vocabulary and so on. Uh, dictionaries for specialist domains, idioms, proverbs, slang, so-called the geflugelte Wörter, you know, phrases which have come out of the classics, which have come out of films, um, you know, the, the, the Russian language, Ruslan's got a talk on this coming up. The, you know, in Russian there are all sorts of, I've been trying to catch up on the Russian films, and all sorts of catchphrases which people have, which come from these films. And, uh, you know, looking at these things, you can really enrich your grasp of the language in those moments when a bulb, a light bulb flashes, uh, because you're with native speakers and you're realising you're getting cultural references, you know, newspaper headlines, you know, the Welsh on BBC, the political commentators, often the headline is some 19th century poem, you know, uh, and you need to know that to get the, the pun in the headline or to get the reference. So you've got to be, you know, uh, drenched in the culture. Uh, you can buy guides to culture, of course, as well, uh, which are interesting, read the history. Uh, yeah, I went to talk, uh, um, uh, you know, someone described it, interpreters and translators should be omniscient, uh, omniscient ignorance like journalists, you need to know everything. Whether you're going to want to read, you know, children's encyclopedias, things like that, again, to push you into areas. Can you talk about mechanics? I was listening to the radio in Germany the other day, was something talking about horse riding. It's all these different parts of saddle, stirrups, you know, all these parts with uh, things to do with horses, you know. So something I would never use myself in my daily life, but it, it's worth, uh, uh, you know, finding out the vocabulary. Now, I was having, getting a new suit the other day, you know, all the vocabulary to do with that, you know, you can print off, there's actually a Wikipedia article in German about the Anzug, yeah, and you get all these terms for different hems and buttons and, you know, cuffs and so on, which you might not know. So going to Wikipedia, printing off in your pet areas, another way to advance the, the vocabulary at a, at, a, at, a, at a high level. So, and of course, doing more and more of your, of your life in the second language, in the areas which are important to you on an ongoing basis, which are the things that you love or your work. Uh, and where you're operating at the highest levels in your own language. So uh, that's it. Thanks a lot. There's, there's five minutes for people to share, uh, uh, you know, their contributions. I see it more as that rather than questions. I don't know. Um, but if anyone's got anything you want to say or they want to add, uh, then that would be great. Actually, it would be rather like a question, but maybe not for you because... 
<laughs> well, anyway, I wanted to ask, you spoke a lot about exams, so I want to ask, does anyone know one of the, you know, what exam in English would you um, recommend? Yeah, I can answer your question. <laughs> uh, hi. L last year I took the C2 uh, Cambridge exam in, for English and I really like that you mentioned exams because I think they're pretty good motivation for yeah, people at the level higher than P2, P2. And actually I took the C2 exam, I got a very very good grade and this is also a point I wanted to add to your presentation. And then I got my certificate and I was really happy of course, a bit proud. But then I thought, and now? And I think this is something really difficult we face at this stage, that when you are at B2, C2 level, you always see the points, the negative points. You always focus on the things you don't know or the things you should know, according to yourself. And I think this is um, one of the main obstacles at this point, yeah. And I recommend the camera certificate for English, yeah. There's a gentleman at the back, yes. Yeah, Alex, yeah, yeah, Alex, yeah. Pass the mic back, please. Maybe the question actually comes forward. Hi, Gary. Um, do you think there can sometimes be a sort of natural glass ceiling to how advanced you can get with certain language? And if so, how can you break it? That's a good one. <laughs> if there is one, I'm nowhere near it. Well, maybe at my own personal glass ceiling, which may be more of you know, sort of a mezzanine level. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, no, I don't think there would be any more than there is in your own language that you can continue to develop different domains. It's just because of this level, it is such a such a broad thing, you know, we can all develop our fluency in, in speaking our own language, in, in writing, uh, or whatever it is. So uh, I think it's just a question of deciding, but then maybe thinking more narrowly. Once you've got through the final exam, what do you do next? Well, then you probably don't, you don't keep advancing on all fronts, because you don't need them. You don't need to know the vocabulary for, you know, uh, putting all the tackle on our horse. Uh, but you do need to know maybe you're into computers, you want to know all the special vocabulary there. So I think it becomes again much more focused on your own needs at that level, that's what I'm saying. And that's the question. What is your main weakness when you reach the C level in foreign language? Uh, sorry, I didn't see that. Here, here. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. What is your main weakness when you reach the C level in, uh, in, in foreign language? What's your main weakness and how did you? develop the skills that people can uh, overcome this weakness and reach, uh, so we'll say, has become a set speaker, or well, something that's impossible. Yeah, well, I think, the main, I mean, I mentioned a couple of my own weaknesses, which was some of the, uh, you know, um, some of the accuracy with the genders in German, for example. Uh, and I think all you can do is keep trying, keep plugging away at it, and with writing, a lot of practice. So a lot of, you know, practice, producing the language, working with a coach or a teacher at those areas where you feel weak. For me, it's accuracy, actually. It's all about accuracy and feeling, you know, ever more able to express the finer distinctions. Okay, maybe one more question. Um, uh, okay, yeah. We're nearly out of time. Hi, uh, I'm a teacher on italki, and I work with a lot of advanced English speakers. And we do a lot of the things that you mentioned in your presentation, um, especially going out of their comfort zone and talking about new topics that they haven't maybe talked about before in English. Um, one thing that I hear from my students a lot is, Am I improving? And it's really difficult for me as a teacher to kind of determine that because we are talking about new topics and they're already at an advanced level and I'm like, your English is great. Like, I, I wish I could speak your native language like you speak English, you know, so it's just a comment. And <laughs> yes, and of course we are, as you say, we're hard on ourselves at this level. The improvement, you know, it's diminishing returns is more difficult is more difficult but then the satisfaction you need to remember remind them how far they've come and you know to remember and some people say you know remember where you were a few years ago uh, and, and what you're doing and, and expect expect only slow progress but always look at the glass as being 99 percent full not one percent empty okay thanks very much everybody